Yeah, finally we figured this out and I'm quite happy um, to present my talk about influencing diversity. Um, yeah, um, to start with, um, I came across this um, uh, a statement, I don't know how do you call it, but um, yeah, the first time I heard this, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Uh, this was this was a statement by Verna Myers, who's a VP of inclusion inclusion strategy at Netflix, and they have quite uh, an intense uh, reporting and um, uh, diversity um, strategies uh, that are implemented at Netflix, which I am quite impressed. Uh, similarly, uh, she has given a talk uh, about how to overcome biases. And I found this talk as well quite interesting when it comes to implicit biases that happen. Um, so let's dive in and see why I came up with this talk. First, I will be talking about why diversity is important. And then I'll be talking about certain things that everybody could do um, in this on these lines just to make sure everybody's included. So I'm from India, uh, specifically to be, uh, uh, my hometown is Bangalore, and uh, it is quite a hub for IT engineers and engineering colleges are quite, you can see quite good diversity, I would say, in engineering colleges uh, to IT fields. So coming from there, um, I did see a lot of difference here in um, Berlin, for instance, where I've been working for more than five years now. And it was quite a shock, uh, to be honest, because uh, out of uh, the six people I was working with, um, all were men and all of them were from Europe at some point, some country or the other. But it was um, initially I did not even get any integration. So it was quite culturally also sh shocking. And uh, also knowing that there are not many women around in the IT or uh, even engineering fields where there were like almost 30 to 40 people in uh, engineering was quite shocking for me. So um, initially, yes, I um, found this. If you look at these pictures, you can see that uh, these were taken taken quite recently, like in 2019, uh, one of them uh, at a deaf fest in Kolkata. And these are from the community I'm still in touch with from Bangalore, uh, which is like a developer community of Android developers all around India, from all around India. Uh, there we have also quite a good diversity of women and we are quite, quite uh, in touch. As you can see, these are picked up by from uh, those um, women who actually shared this with me. So um, I also have a, a community called Coder B where I teach women, um, mostly coders, aspiring coders, or even I have boot camps for people who even want to try their hand in STEM or even programming languages, etc. So this institute is also based on the same lines that I couldn't find enough diversity um, in programming fields and I thought maybe this small community could um, help and empower uh, aspirants who are wanting to learn programming. So that is my Twitter account. If you, anybody's interested, feel free to later add me. I'm quite active on Twitter. So uh, first I was wondering what were the causes of di diversity, lack of diversity. So two things that actually popped up was socialization, which actually includes lack of representation. So what does it mean? Um, IT field being actually one of the fields which is latest, as we all know, uh, the first computer was kind of, uh, first programmers were, um, started working on this in 1940s, I think. So if I'm right, uh, in 1940s, uh, the first ENIAC machine was um, like consisting of six women programmers. And this was a women's job at that point of time. So any clerical jobs, uh, white collar jobs were kind of uh, popular for women to apply for. And as you can see, 
today is not the same and the numbers have fallen quite drastically i would say in the last i don't know 70 years so what was the reason was something i was pondering on and it came to my notice that at some point uh, in 60s and 70s uh, majorly the ad agencies started um, talking and uh, representing men and nerds like male nerds as a, a face of computer science or engineering in general and then the whole um, the t tables turned and the whole concept of women being a, um, being in a computer sciences was turned into otherwise and very few women were actually enrolling into these um, IT fields after that. So this is uh, kind of now is led to lack of representation and uh, secondly it's the institutional bias. This is what uh, where you don't see many people in this um, uh, in this kind of job because at certain point of time there was also institutional bias where certain kind of job were not meant for women. For instance, if I can quote from a book called Invisible Women, which is full of data of women who were not credited for their work or because of laws or systematic uh, sexism, they were not credited for what they um, invented, for instance, or uh, for, uh, also like for the music uh, that they created. So this is kind of a systematic um, sexism that also came into uh, notice when I was doing some research. And this leads to some kind of subconscious bias uh, at workplaces or anywhere you are actually uh, interacting with people, which uh, I'll be talking about a bit later as well. Um, when I talk about implicit bias. So yeah, these are the two main reasons in the societies, um, as far as I understand, uh, leads to lack of diversity. And it's the cause for what it is today, uh, what we see as, as a society today. So biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they are. We just look at people and we assume things. Our minds make up, uh, make belief about someone, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe a person of color or maybe someone uh, looking different than one looks. So these are totally based on, um, I'm mostly talking on the levels of implicit biases. It doesn't have to be conscious bias, but it, it could be also like unconsciously you're uh, implicitly biased towards uh, something um, that someone you cannot identify with or trust or someone uh, you do not find yourself similar with. And that's why uh, there was a study and a project which was kind of um, majorly, I looked into this and at Harvard, uh, they did this study of implicit biases and they saw that most people who took this test about implicit bias failed the test. And this test was majority was to mostly identify uh, if there was any bias of, against people of color in West American society. And anyone who lived in the American society had by default biases. And anyone who did not live, for instance, a black person who did not live in America, did not show this kind of behavior. So it was quite sure that even black Americans uh, who are living in America have these kind of implicit biases built in them, mostly because of uh, the societal society, how uh, it uh, enforces this. So, okay, now we know why uh, biases exist, but why should businesses care about this? Um, businesses as a engineer and as I've worked in startup for a long time, I can easily say that businesses care about their products reaching the universal market or the global market and they want to make sure that they're accessible to everybody and they also want to build, I would say as a part of being in business, I would like to build a product which would be also useful to everyone. And that also brings us to the point where 
built for everyone means for all users of diverse backgrounds, which means with like how Francesca was also mentioning, people who need special accessibility and uh, who can find these kind of products useful. And that's why we need representation from every background to bring something to the table. And this is exactly the reason also people source people and talent from across the globe, because if you want to build for diverse, crowd, you would have to have more representation in the workforce who can cover and help with all these use cases that businesses serve. So because we all love stats, let's look into some stats. And this is like very basic, but I did look into some of these stats, which were uh, on from Stack Overflow, um, which was kind of compiled by Jeff Skiller. But um, I would recommend you to go take a look at this link and see how um, diversity um, uh, stats look like. But uh, when someone in the IT industry was asked uh, who values diversity, you can see that majority of them said they did value diversity. Um, not just in IT, but if you also see in uh, bigger companies and financial companies like McKinsey, they have special um, also reports based on diversity and how diversity can influence people and uh, companies uh, in uh, growing and in also in scaling. So the results show here that the likelihood of financial performance about the national industry medium, uh, which was 50, above 15 percent and 35 percent uh, in ethnical, ethnically diverse companies. I also have seen some reports which Google uh, kind of also um, publishes about, um, say, include diversity and inclusion, which is quite, uh, which I look for and I find it quite interesting. On the similar lines, um, so there was a Google Air research that was taken place, and this is kind of copied from the uh, from the slide which Francisca kind of shared with me at some point of time. Um, so this research was completely based on um, like to show why diversity was important. And uh, the study showed that organizations with greater diversity were associated with greater profits, sales values, customer bases, greater market share, etc. And um, it also showed that uh, teams with organizations with heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous um, crowd, uh, of course, in meaningful ways, had way higher potential than homogeneous crowds. Um, not just by Google research. If you look at uh, Harvard Business Review, you can also find these research about diversity where uh, homogeneous crowds, it shows that homogeneous crowd are very comfortable with each other um, because of similar backgrounds, but they, that is not particularly good for performance. And also heterogeneous crowds are quite uncomfortable initially to adjust to the environment uh, and integrate, but the more heterogeneous the crowd was, the better the performance uh, was. And um, so um, moving on to the next one, individuals on team with higher psychological safety are more likely to harness the power of ideas. That means when somebody has this safety net of speaking up and feel safe in the uh, environment, always will be able to criticize uh, constructively and provide uh, good feedback and bring good ideas to the table. And this is why they also are rated twice as effective by their executives. So now we know why there is a diversity problem, but how do we influence this and change this? Uh, how do we reverse the diversity problem? I think um, Shamla has also covered this, Francisca has covered this. Of course, today's topic is about diversity. I would like to also point out certain things which might be helpful in bringing more uh, heterogeneous crowds into um, 
communities uh, into uh, new cities and areas and how to um, how, how to empower this crowd to actually do well to actually come out in the communities and thrive so instead of doing a bottom-up approach we can do a top-down approach um sorry i th i think i said it that way <laughs> instead of top down let's do a bottom up approach which means that it should start at schools at at a smaller age when we have seen that uh, studies show that high school students are still interested like girls are still interested and are thriving in um, engineering areas fields and mathematics and stem fields but only after high school that they kind of change their mind and take a completely different path for certain reasons. So what do we do is like first start at home and build non-biased communities and environment for children where boys and girls are actually exposed to ideas which could be engineering, mathematics or anything of that sort equally. And there's no bias in uh, kind of stereotyping uh, girls to do only certain kind of job or play with certain kind of toys. Engagement and involvement at an early age is crucial. Like I said, it's really good if it's way before high school. And in also in schools, there could be biases. Like I said, drama and theater and music, like they could be biases in the curriculum or even in the majors that uh, students take and it is also the responsibility of teachers and everyone around to make sure there is no stereotyping and everybody is exposed to the same curriculum and ideologies and finally to bestow children with learning opportunities and demonstrate that something that one can build with their own hands has much more joy that can actually the joy of creation is much more uh, fulfilling and satisfaction when you actually show them that they will be able to explore this by themselves um, going forward. So let's come to the topic of representation. We covered that how to bring um, more, uh, say, girls into STEM. Um, let's talk about a little bit of why we should be there as in seeing is believing just to represent a community as quite a lot that somebody can take especially when you walk into a room if the room is not heterogeneous and uh, imagine if they're all uh, of one kind like your audience your talk everything changes uh, who you're addressing sometimes is totally different and um, this is why there are role models who are required and who need to be encouraged to be there. Uh, even if it doesn't mean like you're not talking, you're not empowering others, it's fine. It's just to be there and not everyone can do this or maybe can do this at some coaching, after some coaching. But it's important to like be in the communities as role models for other juniors and aspirants um this is why also another reason at coder b we also do this that we make sure that uh, role models are a part, huge part of uh, the community and also the mentors of course um so it's not just about in gender uh, i'm talking about also diversity in topics in interdisciplinary topics like some with psychology background can add so much value in hr or even uh being a manager for instance or uh it could be anything like everyday generalists who learn from different um areas and domains have can have like huge impacts on solving uh engineering problems or any problem in the industry because they have an outsider perspective what it's called which is a huge advantage to problem solving so this is why we need also crowd heterogeneous crowd which are of different backgrounds and not just uh, of age or color or it's it's not restricted to any of this and creating safe space at any workplace is crucial mostly because if you have like 
leaders or even women speaking up uh, about diversity, asking questions to use inclusive language. And to Ali, it is important to have a safe space because if it is dismissed or turned down immediately, uh, of course, people will not feel encouraged to do this. So the basic reason why I'm putting this here is that if somebody is speaking up against not having enough diversity, encourage them and tell them it's important and uh, talk about it, come up with ideas, ask them for ideas. Um, not just that, language normalizes and it conveys care and respect and like being inclusive, like using the inclusive language is most important, especially when people are coming from different area or when you're dealing with people of different genders, it's always important to show that you care everybody in the room. And allyship is um, not just allying with people with, um, you know, uh, women or anyone uh, specially, but anyone who is not a majority can be considered a marginalized group. And you don't have to have like a curriculum to add someone. You can just support someone uh, in any little way that is possible. And there are different levels of allyship. There's also sponsorship, how uh, Shamla was mentioning. You can be a mentor, you can be an ally, just support them during um, some crisis or even uh, like talk about uh, somebody's um, like accomplishments uh, where it could benefit their uh, profile or um, yeah, skills, etc. So um, code of conduct. This is another big uh, topic when it comes to creating a safe place. Um, every small, big group, communities and companies, in my opinion, should have a code of conduct, mostly because um, if it's anyone, like any company, more than one person, in my opinion, requires some certain rules to stick by uh, just so that everyone feels safe and everyone feels like, okay, we know that these are the things we believe in or you can emphasize on as a code or an ethic, work ethic, um, as a part of work ethic in the company. So it's not, not just enough to like get people into uh, these areas of STEM or um, yeah, workplaces, for instance. W what is also important is that to make sure that they stay. And that is the biggest challenge, not just while bringing people. It's in, I have seen that in the last years, I've done so many boot camps and workshops. It was easy to get people to come attend these just by marketing, just by going and posting in some communities, it was easy to get people to do this. But what was most challenging was to make people stick with this. Out of 42 people who registered for a Python learning workshop, um, we did a co-learning session for like three months every Monday. And after the, by the end, there were two people who graduated. And they were like, mostly around eight to 10 people who attended this regularly. By the end, there were just four and only two graduated. So this shows that there is there are very few people who are who can actually stick to these. And if you can show that the support is there, if you show that uh, there is someone who is going to help you and empower you and lift you, that's when people uh, kind of want to stay in the community. The community mindedness and uh, the inclusiveness that is in the community kind of uh, helps people to come back and ask for help. Seeking for help is something that's not easy and it requires people to be vulnerable and that's why it's important to be open and um, also for leaders, community leaders, managers to, to be able to talk and empower people in a way that uh, that they feel safe and they feel like, yeah, okay, um, I can be myself here. And being vulnerable and authentic. Of course, nobody knows everything. Nobody has to be a Wikipedia. Nobody, um, it, it's just impossible. Just uh, acknowledging this fact and to be 
truly authentic to oneself and also truly be vulnerable and be able to accept, okay, I don't know this, but I'm willing to learn. And also in the communities, it's important as a mentor to be appreciative and to celebrate milestones because these, even the little things that we do, like a hi-fi or even the tone in the way uh, a celebration is conveyed or even a small gesture can make a huge difference. And always appreciate juniors, uh, especially if you're a senior, um, appreciate everyone for what they do, be it your boss, be it your manager, be it anyone. If they've done something good, be appreciative in general, just to emphasize on the fact that what they've done is crucial for someone and it makes a difference. And finally, to create a sense of belonging and purpose. And this is some, something that I also read, um, like the vulnerability part, belonging and purpose is something that comes um, when people trust each other and when they feel like they're in a safe place. Then you all kind of, everybody starts to feel that uh, as a part of community, people start identifying themselves and say that, yeah, we all are, part of this community, like for instance, Koderby community or Women Who Go community. Um, so yeah, it's important to have that sense where people support each other and um, find a purpose. Oh, sorry about, yeah. Um, so this is very crucial, like this is very, uh, one of my core values that I find that I've also received a lot of good feedback from uh, my juniors and co-workers about, uh, I've also talked about this, um, yeah, like quite a bit about how to be good mentor, uh, maybe for another time, but being an empathetic mentor is the crucial thing that is important as a quality to be a mentor and um, be an unofficial mentor. You don't have to be designated to do this, but, um, yeah, just mentor someone if they want anything, like look into their resume if somebody is looking for a job uh, or share their profile with on Twitter uh, if, it, if you have like a better reach. So it's just not about um, asking for help. When you need somebody is seeking out, just be there and try to create a ripple where um, yeah, somebody is benefited. It doesn't always have to be as a designated person, for instance. So what are the challenges when it comes to diversity? Um, some of the challenges I found is like misrepresentation of data, where many companies are posting these reports about how diverse and amazing their companies are and they're showing profits and growth but this is still not true to all areas and all places and uh, there is manipulation at certain extent of data manipulation at certain levels where uh, the data could lie actually so what you see is always not something that you should also believe because um, there is quite a lot of misrepresentation going on online. And tokenism, tokenism is a topic where you do see like, you know, people of color or women or uh, just being photoshopped into something or just being getting like special invites only because, uh, yeah, only because you're different. Uh, people think you're different and they you can add value in a way not because of your professional skills, but just to be there. So it's it's exactly the opposite of being a role model, but when somebody tries to use you, it's it becomes tokenism. And um, sometimes talking about diversity itself, especially being a woman, I can easily say it can be mistaken for abrasiveness. And, uh, but still, I think it should not be, uh, uh, it, it, it's still a topic that should be talked about very widely. And many people I see say that I had no idea. And this is something that we could change by this kind of talks, that being uninformed is okay. Just everybody's learning and just to be there and listen when somebody is talking about something which is quite 
not the norm it's okay to not know but to change and to modify is something to have the willingness even to modify is something that is usually appreciated and finally it could also be because people did not ever have to do this that that the system directly gives them a, a free pass to some place or some opportunity and people never had to think about diversity ever so these everybody in this group can be actually these challenges can be tackled that by doing something to make a difference a small change and almost we are at the end of the talk and i would like to say that lack of diversity is nobody's fault but inclusivity is everybody's responsibility and that's pretty much what i had in my mind today and these are some inspirations and yeah thank you very much for this opportunity and listening to me thanks